is Sonia Epstein. I am the executive editor and associate curator of science and film here at the museum, and I curate our science on screen film series. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Sound of Silence. Thank you so much for coming on such a beautiful day. So Science on Screen explores everything from seahorses to robots to dust through a scientific lens, bringing researchers and filmmakers to the museum for wide-ranging discussions that offer new perspectives on both film and scientific subject matter. Today, I am very excited to share with you this new film, the script of, of which I first read about uh, six years ago in its earlier iteration as a short film called Palimpsest. The writers, Ben Nabors and Michael Tybersky, Michael, who we are lucky enough to have with us here today, won an award to develop Palimpsest through the Hamptons International Film Festival's partnership with the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. I interviewed Ben and Michael in 2015 as they were developing what became The Sound of Silence, and they said at the time, being a scientist seems a lot like being a filmmaker in the sense that you often strive to create or prove something that doesn't yet exist. Often, you have to convince yourself and others that something is there or that it's worth pursuing because before you have any hard proof of it. So, The Sound of Silence made its premiere at the Sundance Film Festival this year, and I've been eager to share it with audiences here ever since. The main character in the film, as you will see shortly, is extremely sensitive to sounds in his environment and works professionally tuning objects that make sounds that most people never hear or pay attention to. So joining Michael today, we are very lucky to have with us renowned physicist Jana Levin, the Director of Sciences and Chair of Science Studios at Pioneer Works, as well as the Claire Tao Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Barnard College of Columbia University. Jana has contributed to an understanding of black holes, the cosmology of extra dimensions, and gravitational waves in the shape of space-time. She is an acclaimed writer, and her latest beautifully written book, Black Hole Blues and Other Songs from Outer Space is about the discovery of the sound of two black holes colliding over a billion years ago. So I urge all of you to stick around after the film as we consider silence. Uh, and in the meantime, please enjoy. OK, so Michael, to start, I wanted to ask you uh, how you came up with the idea of a professional house tuner, and also if in that answer maybe you could explain, explain a little bit what the historical clips are that we see at the beginning of the film and in the middle. Certainly. I, I, first, I'd just like to say that uh, it's such a wonderful experience to screen in this theater. This happens to be one of my favorite theaters in New York City, and I was watching from the back uh, for the beginning, and it also just sounds fantastic in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Very important. That's right. Uh, inspiration for the house tuner dates back, uh, th as you mentioned in your introduction, this was based on a, a short film called Palimpsest at the time that I wrote uh, with my friend and uh, producer uh, Ben Neighbors. And he, he actually, he came to me with this idea for a character called the house tuner before we made the short. And I, I fell in love with the idea of, you know, I suppose, you know, someone who kind of dresses like a high school science teacher and is professorial in that way uh, and shows up at your door, you know, but isn't a charlatan, is, uh, you know, has a very specific sonic prescription. And I really like that as a kind of a conceit to uh, to tell a story. And we, we, we turned, you know, we, we took that character, we made it into a short film, and that was kind of that, and we, we premiered at Sundance, and it was received really well. This was back in 2013, and it kind of organically uh, turned into uh, th th this feature. I, I love the idea, I suppose, of now taking that character, and we realized we had a lot of interest in uh, uh, kind of sound phenomena, and uh, the, the interest in sound as a theme that this character could work as this kind of perfect conduit to tell a bigger story about sound. So there are a lot of things uh, that we wanted to kind of turn it into a feature. Uh, but your next question on the the, 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 the opening yeah. of the archival clip, uh, that was something Ben and I are both very, um, uh, we, we, we got really into the research of kind of making a movie that has a science theme and has this fictional character though. Uh, and th we stumbled upon this, uh, that, that piece of uh, archival material. It's, fun, it's from um, the Fox movie tone, uh, 35 millimeter uh, newsreels that mm -hmm. they, they shot. It's from 1929. and. In th around that time, the, I think you know the city was uh, responding to the fact that a lot of uh, people were complaining about the noise all of a sudden. There, uh, this was a period when automobiles were relatively new. 
uh, you know, construction was going up. There was a, it was a louder city than New York was used to, kind of near the turn of the century. And the Department of Health uh, commissioned something called the Noise Abatement Commission they put together. Uh, and those gentlemen uh, were, I love the idea of you know, essentially kind of sound scientists. Uh, I also just love their aesthetic. When, when people, you know, dressed really well in the city uh, and took things, uh, the, 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 it just puts a certain predominance on it. But it, it felt, I suppose, I love, I love a good curtain closure. Uh, I, it, it felt, I suppose, you know, that a uh, hundred years ago, if we were already thinking about sound, it didn't seem so far from that a house group exists years later. And it also, of kind of a, on a scientific note, the the decibel had just been invented around that time, so that was a new kind of form of measurement. And they, you know, they determined that Times Square and an area formerly known as Radio Row, where the World Trade Center. Uh, became uh, were the loudest in the city, but didn't fix it at all. Obviously, we've, it's, it's only gotten worse. And uh, I think that's the thing about sound. You just learn different ways to, to cope with it because there is really no solution to, to the noise. Okay, so Jana, as a, as a physicist, why, uh, who has done some research on sound, which we'll get into, um, why, were you in, why are you interested in sound? Um, I don't think that I... I necessarily would have been, hadn't been foisted on me, had it not been foisted on me. So, you know, there were certain scientific discoveries um, that led us to think differently about the way we view the universe. If you think about most of our observations of the universe, very nearly every one comes to us from light. So it's really a way of seeing. And we've compiled this kind of spectacular, silent movie of the universe over the past couple hundred years, few hundred years since we've had telescopes, and it, it is a silent movie. Um, and we thought it would always be that way in some sense. And we, are, we also have the ability to look into the past because of this magic property of light, that mm -hmm. light takes time to get to us. So we not only look into space, we look into time. And, um, and that silent movie was extraordinary, and it was more or less the only tool we had. Um, and I think the concept that we could have a different kind of recording device was really challenging and, um, and, um, and seemed very unlikely to succeed, frankly. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe you can tell us, uh, to, to get more specific, maybe people mm -hmm. remember from a few years ago that, that there was this like chirp that was discovered, uh, as, it, as it was described. Um, and I think it was also noted that it was maybe a B flat, if I remember correctly. Oh, um, I, I don't, I don't know. There, there were other. There is another. So there are people who do things like sound really through a medium. So people who look at, let's say, a big gooey plasma around a black hole and look at the speed of sound through that medium. And I mm -hmm. think there's a B flat out there. Oh, <laughs> but this is really fundamentally yeah. different. It changes frequency. It is in the human auditory range, but um, you're referring to the collision of two black holes, and um, which happened 1.3 billion years ago. And there was this kind of race over the past 50 years, if you think that um, the signal was traveling through the universe since multi-celled organisms were differentiated. Yeah, it's just kind of wild. And it, a lot of people um, at first would object to calling it sound. What it really is is a wave in the shape of space and time itself. It really is, um, uh, if you were falling around these two black holes, you would feel your orbit change. You would be squeezed and stretched. It's really a, in the shape of space. But if you imagine floating nearby, because it just by coincidence happens to happen in the human auditory range, it is conceivable that the ear would technically respond, even though there's no air, there's no medium, and you would hear it um, a lot louder than we heard it. Um, and if you did hear it, you should like get out of there, because <laughs> you might not see it. Those two black holes were completely dark. So when, um, when it was recorded, it was the most powerful event we've ever detected since the Big Bang. And it happened in complete darkness. None of it came out as light. There was no way to take a picture of the event. The only thing that uh, we could aspire to do would be to record the ringing of the drum of space-time itself hmm. and play it back through an amplifier, kind of how an electric guitar works, right? You record the ringing string and you play it back through a conventional amplifier. And if you go into the control room of these experiments, they're like listening to the instrument wow. through speakers. <laughs> so, so. Uh, so people thought that there would be a sound to hear, uh, 
Be yeah, cool. so the these these waves in the shape of space-time were known as gravitational waves, coined by Einstein, and he thought it was the most important project to work on as soon as he understood his theory of curved space-time. Um, but he never really believed we'd record any such thing, because you need these really catastrophic, calamitous events, and he didn't think black holes were real, and it was sensible for him to think they weren't real, because it's very unusual to crush matter to a point, it just doesn't seem like something that matter would allow you to do. And it was decades of people arguing about whether or not black holes existed. And and in this, by the 60s, late 60s and 70s, people like Ray Weiss, who was one of the three recipients of the Nobel Prize for this detection, started just saying, you know, I don't know, why don't we just go out and have a look around? He's like a practical guy. He wanted to build something. And, um, and he talks about starting life building high fives and wanting to build something that would be like this cosmic recording device. And uh, 50 some years later, and a billion dollars later, and a thousand scientists later, um, they succeeded in what was a very improbable um, experiment. So um, to talk about tools for a second, you're referring to LIGO, which is um, the, the tool that they use to listen to, to black holes. Michael, in the film, uh, Peter uses a lot of tools that uh, seem to sort of be from another era. And one part of his character is that he you know, works tuning period instruments, which sort of adds, adds this layer. Um, and I'm curious, in terms of uh, picking those out for the film and set and props, how you decided what tools he would use if you did any field research? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, he, they are from a specific era. I mean, Peter is one of these characters who's, I suppose, not stuck in time, but uh, just maybe was at his best at a certain time. And I, I like to think that, you know, even though his, his tools might appear antiquated, they, they still work, um, they're still functional, and he's just the type of individual who feels, you know, that old kind of thing. If it's not broken, why fix it? And he's, you know, so he's, he's a little bit, um, uh, you know, uh, loves, loves, loves that period. I, I, I personally like kind of the tactile quality of things, uh, recording devices specifically, um, from, you know, the, the, the period of instrument he's using. But there's also, you know, a little bit of precedent in it. We, we found that there's not a house tuner that exists as far as we understand, but there is a, a gentleman who I've never met, uh, but I've, I've done a lot of kind of uh, uh, research on the internet. Of, uh, he's, he's very public, he writes a lot of uh, pieces um, and appears in columns in the New York Times usually as kind of like a, an audio expert. And uh, he's a, a, a acoustician, I believe is his uh, formal titer, title. Uh, he, we, we looked at his instruments, what he carries in his tool bags to record the sound and measure sound in people's apartments, usually for, for um, litigious purposes, if a neighbor is suing someone for being uh, too loud. They call him this guy. Uh, and he uses one thing called the spectrum analyzer, which we, you know, we, we see in the film. And, uh, it's uh, he's operating today, so I, I like to think that the, these are practical instruments uh, yeah. that, that might work. And yeah, Peter's just not a, uh, a digital guy, I suppose. He and the, on top of that, you know, the idea when when we used to have answering machines, he just he's not a guy who would carry a cell phone because suddenly that's a that's an interference in his day. That's a, that's a an, an unexpected occurrence that he he wants a little bit more control, I suppose, as part of part of that aesthetic as well. Hmm. Uh, so, so by contrast, Janet, could you tell us a little bit what LIGO uh, is or what it looks like? And, and well, I was, as I was listening to you describe this, it, um, it reminded me, like Ray, there was, a, there was a fire in the Brooklyn Paramount when he was a kid, um, and he got to claim all of these speaker systems, you know, and just the idea of him lugging, he said he lugged like 20 of them on the subway back to Manhattan, um, and he was making these these funny circuits, and, and that's what he wanted to do, and he still has these old speakers like in his office in there. Well, he has one of them. Um, and, uh, and when he first started building this instrument, I mean, the details of it aren't so important, but it's it, it really is like a way to measure if if the drum is ringing, and it, it really is like a musical instrument in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, and Ray describes that it's sensitive to the frequency of the piano, but when he started building this, he was building it in the Plywood Palace, which is this legendary building on the periphery of the MIT campus. It was a very shabby structure and, um, and uh, was supposed to be up for like five years to initiate science and the war effort, and somehow it 
gave birth to like 20 Nobel Prizes. Right? <laughs> and it was almost like the shabbiness of the structure and the irreverence for it allowed them to be just incredibly creative. And hmm. so he started building this instrument and his, his peers were telling him, you're going to get fired, you're not going to get tenure, you know, all this stuff. And he was kind of struck that his instrument really wasn't any good. And he started to think about what's he going to do. Hmm. It couldn't possibly have recorded the ringing of space time because by the time it gets to us, it's just epically quiet, right? Human beings couldn't possibly hear it, and you need this. So he does, for years, for years, campaigns to build something that's four kilometers long, right? So now it's a four kilometer instrument on two coasts. It's a massive endeavor. And when they recorded the ringing of space, when you're really watching something bob on the wave, they recorded a change of less than one ten thousandth the width of a proton over those four kilometers. <laughs> Jesus. So it was an technological absolute feat. Yeah. Absolute feat. And even when they finished it, they just didn't know if nature would provide sources loud enough. So so even with the success of the technology, Ray would say, like right before the instrument was back up and running, he would say, This could be a failure. So just to be, so doesn't sound fade over time. I'm just like, is that why it was? Yeah, so it is. It, it gets quieter, yeah. and it is. It is like sound in the sense that it's really hard to tell where it came from. You know, when your phone's ringing and you can't see it, it's really hard to pinpoint it. Yeah. If you see it, you know exactly where it is. So light is is much better at directional information. It's much easier to tell where something came from. But when you're listening to these black holes colliding, they're incredibly quiet because it happened very far away. And yes, it gets quieter with time. You know, so if it had been another uh, half a billion years away, um, light years away, we probably wouldn't have heard it. And in fact, the instrument was running a few years ago in a, in a less advanced configuration. And, and presumably, those two black holes were orbiting each other, banging on the drum of space time, and the sound was washing over us. Okay, And we just were not yet at the total sophistication to be able to detect it. I want Peter. I wonder what Peter would say about it. <laughs> <laughs> he would have liked the original little dinky little thing. You know? yeah. um, there is something charming about those old, that the old sort of instrumentation. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, do you remember hearing about Lago's discovery? Uh, no, this is incredibly fascinating. I, I mean, I'm obviously not a scientist, uh, but I, I'm making I'm a all fan. of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, just one more question about that, which is, um, there's another, uh, you know, event that happened in the universe that has a sonic element in its name, which is the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And is that something that's like? Yeah. Almost? Technically, we focus on black holes because they're loud and they're plentiful. If black hole was ringing in our galaxy, if, the two, if two black holes were merging in our galaxy, we would hear it loud and clear at the instrument, and still not with our ears, but, but it just happens so infrequently it, that it doesn't happen in our backyard, it's very unlikely. The Big Bang is another source that, yes, space was probably chaotically um, vibrating after the Big Bang, and um, some people were hoping that we would directly detect this kind of stochastic background. Um, a lot of things happen between now and then, and it's very possible that, as we were saying, it gets quieter, that it's yeah. just washed away, that it's silent. But people do look for Big Bang, they look for things like neutron stars colliding, which are dead stars that don't quite become black holes. Even look for crazy things like cosmic strings and stuff we haven't thought of before. Um, so far, it's just been black holes and neutron stars. Which is pretty great. <laughs> it's pretty great. I'm happy with that. <laughs> but if you hear people talk about it, they were hoping that we'd be like adding this soundtrack to the universe, right? And that as instruments went to space and became more sophisticated, and that that it would no longer, <clears throat> excuse me, be this silent movie. So, uh, Michael, one of the things that you know, sin really, since I first read this story, I feel like and it's stuck with me in a certain way of. Um, just you know, paying attention to sound a little bit more than I used to, um, and even hearing about LIGO and black holes, it, it, it does add another layer of, of a way of, to be attuned to sort of the, the environment. And I'm, I'm curious how making a movie about uh, somebody who is so attuned to their environment, um, particularly to sounds, impacted the way that you think about sounds in movies. Uh, yeah, qu qu quite quite a bit. I mean, sound in movies, and but also uh, sound in general. I mean, I mentioned like 
you know, Ben and I did a lot of research making the movie. I mean, we 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 probably versed ourselves in anecdotal pieces at best related to science, but the things that are extremely intriguing that I think you know, like I think about still, and you know, worked its way thematically into the movie. But the the two things I, I often talk about besides the black black hole registering as a B flat, which I had heard too, and I, I, I like that we think about mm-hmm. sounds on a Western musical scale. Mm-hmm. Um, but the earlier, you know, before that maybe happened. Uh, the, you know, the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church uh, banned certain tones from being played uh, because they associated them with evil. And we were already, you know, we were thinking 500 years ago about the way sound affects our emotions. Uh, and then there's a little later, around the, the, the in the in the, 19, in the 20th century, uh, the the famous um, performance of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, Rite, Rite of Spring. Uh, caused all of these protests and people kind of left the theater and there's been a lot of you know a mystery around it and from what I understand it was finally neuroscientists who determined that uh, people were reacting to microtones for the first first time Uh, you know that this was kind of a new instrumentation new new ways of hearing uh, music and uh, it created quite a physical, neurological reaction to it. So I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by just everyone's relationship with sound. You know, I, I think we all have a relationship to sound, whether we are aware of it or it's, it's you know, subconscious at times. And yeah, I, 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 I can't go in a room or into a movie theater and not pay attention to the doors opening or the air conditioning. A lot of people now report to me uh, who see the film in a theater, uh, whether or not an air conditioner comes on. And it's, uh, <laughs> I wish I didn't know that all the time. But uh, yeah, I think it's, um, I, 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 tr- I try to uh, cope with it much like Peter Lucian, I suppose. I, I don't have a heightened sense of hearing, but I'm just very aware of the sounds around me a lot. I, I think it's a good thing. It's e- even though there's not always an answer for it, but just to be, think about how this is affecting us um, yeah. or that we, you know, when you walk by a jackhammer on the street of New York City, why you instinctively kind of cover your ears, why, what is causing that kind of emotional reaction. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I want to uh, open it up to questions, even though I could keep going. Uh, uh, from the scientific point of view, thanks for your movie. Um, I'm just curious about how do you pinpoint, as far as the colliding black holes, that there isn't other interference that's filtering into that, mm-hmm. specifically pinpointing that? So um, gravity is actually incredibly weak. And I always talk about this. I, I'm resisting the entire Earth with my little arm here and the <laughs> microphone. And that's quite amazing that gravity is so weak. So once the gravitational waves are emitted, it, they just don't interact very strongly, even if they pass through galaxies. And um, so, so they they come pretty um, crisp, right? So they, they and that's not true with light. So if something is emitting a star in our galaxy, a lot of the light can be absorbed by dust and re-emitted and scattered and it looks redder and it can be very confusing what you're looking at. So the good thing about the gravitational waves is that they're relatively unimpeded by anything in, in their path, including us. It wasn't absorbed by the instrument. It passed right through an instrument in Louisiana. It was recorded, this, this ringing, the gravitational waves. And then it skimmed across the continental U.S. and was recorded on an instrument in Washington State, and then it kept going, right? So, um, so yeah, it, it, that's to our advantage. What's hard is how quiet it is. Yeah, uh, on the side, yeah, you had your hand up before. I have a question about the movie, about the instruments that were playing at the end of the movie. Was that a theremin, or was that a violin? Oh yeah, yeah, great, great, great ear. It, it, was, it was a theorem, and it's actually it's a recording. Uh, yeah, I, 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 f- I fell in love with that uh, instrument when we, I was when we were uh, researching, and getting into the movie, and I found that piece. It's um, performed by Claire Rockmore. If, if, if uh, she was um, kind of, uh, if there was ever a virtuoso of the instrument, she was it. Uh, the, the instrument was actually tweaked by Leon Theremin, the namesake, uh, for her, so that she could um, play it and. It comes from an era when, just as a, a quick aside on the theremin, because I, I can go deep on it, I, I love it. Uh, that was it from an era when she would actually play performances at Carnegie Hall in New York City with other thereminists uh, uh, together. And it's, uh, if anybody doesn't know, it's, it's an instrument that you essentially don't touch. It's a box uh, that works on electromagnetic waves. And uh, it's known as kind of ether music because you play it on the air. And I, I th- I, it's sometimes associated with 
you know, Hitchcock used it and uh, so kind of like B science fiction films because it's eerie sounding, but I think it also can be really uh, beautiful. And it always just felt like uh, I knew I wanted to include it in the movie somehow uh, from the beginning. But th thank, thanks for picking up on it. Was, was that the same instrument in the Beach Boys song, Goodbye Dreams? It is, absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, very, yeah. Sure. So background with sound. Yeah, big ones. Uh, great question. So the uh, background with sound. I mean, I'm. I, I, I suppose uh, as a, a movie lover, I often say this, but it's you know I, I I like when sound is done well in movies. It's it's, it's usually underutilized. Uh, I still you know even though we've had sound in motion pictures uh, for almost a century, we, we still, you know, kind of, we leave a movie theater and we say we, we, we've seen a movie, and, but I believe, you know, we, we see and we hear a movie, and I think that's an active thing. Uh, so I've always been interested in kind of, you know, uh, heightening that in the world uh, of making a movie, and even whether I make a movie about sound um, or as a plot device or, or not, it's, it's still something that is always an important tool. But we uh, were really fortunate on this movie uh, because it had such a big sound component, uh, we, we got a generous uh, grant and support from uh, Dolby, uh, when, actually before we made the movie, when they read the script and um, you know, uh, understood that it was going to be, uh, sound was so prevalent in it. And they uh, gave us a grant that allowed us to mix in this technology called Dolby Atmos, uh, which is usually reserved for uh, very big budget um, blockbuster movies and oh, ours is... Exactly. Yeah, at Astra, among them, uh, it's the we're we're a very small New York uh, independent film, uh, and it's uh, I, I didn't think that um, you could do as I, I was I suppose not skeptical, but uh, I, I didn't know a lot about the technology, and once I got into it, um, it's I was just really impressed of how much you can actually do the the idea that. It's, we understand, most people understand kind of 5.1 and 7.1 is surround sound. It's, it's a lot of speakers in a theater. Uh, Atmos, which is short for atmosphere, uh, is, is a lot of speakers, but it means that wherever you are situated in a, in a movie theater, uh, you experience sound in the same way, the way the, the, the technology is designed. And you can bring out a lot more nuances um, in, in, in the sound. So for our, our film and a character who, you know, kind of hears beyond uh, what others do in a city, it worked great to translate to kind of like heightening those very specific sounds. Uh, we, the, the, you know, kind of lastly on sound, we, we treated it as a character, so to speak. From the script stage, we, we introduced all the sound elements as if they were, you know, a, the way you would formally introduce a, a, a new character in a screenplay. Uh, so it was always really important when we were writing and, and then shooting and then before we actually got to the mix. Uh, casting wise, I, you know, this is my first feature, but I, I got really lucky with uh, kind of my ideal cast. This, uh, I wanted Peter Sarsgaard from the beginning. Um, fortunately, he um, uh, read the script and it resonated with him. He's also someone who uh, is very music incli musically inclined personally. He plays the violin. Uh, he considers himself to have very good hearing, not absolute pitch, but something close to it. Um, so th there was a great kind of kindred spirit in the character and, and Peter Sarsgaard in real life that translated really well. And, uh, the, you know, the, the, the rest of the casting, I, I know I, I wanted to fill it kind of with kind of my favorite um, eccentric New Yorkers in a way uh, and uh, to, to help kind of ground this somewhat fantastical idea, even though I think a house tuner could exist, even though it doesn't. Uh, somewhat in a you know grounded New York. Uh, that's why we you know made sure to have touchstones like the New Yorker. To make, is, we wanted to ask that question like, is does this exist or are we watching this kind of romanticized version of New York? But the casting um, you know was was led, led into that idea. Okay, we have time for maybe one more. Yeah, right here. Well, uh, uh, me. Yeah. 
you chose a title for your full-length feature, which has a certain pop relevance already, as it is, mm -hmm. Paul Simon, uh, The Sound of Silence, in which uh, this is an ominous song, Darkness, My Old Friend. What do you see The Sound of Silence? Is it something, after all, we end w basically with silence as the power is out and Ellen and Peter aren't communicating, and the last thing that we see is a smile, as if he realizes something there. Are you in line with Paul Simon in thinking that <laughs> the sound of silence is a thing to be warned about and to fear, or can it be a benign thing? Did everybody hear? <coughs> okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, obviously I'm, 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 I'm a big fan of the song. Uh, the, the, this, uh, this, just as a quick context, you know, uh, as Sonia mentioned uh, earlier too, this was, um, the, the project was originally titled Palimpsest, that was our short. Um, unfortunately, a, a very, uh, not a lot of people know that word anymore. It's not in our, you know, current lexicon and we, uh, but the, the, there is a great metaphor that we liked and it essentially it translates to those who don't know uh, it's kind of writing on an old piece of paper and the traces of the uh, old writing remain on a, on, a, on, a, on a piece of paper and I like to think about New York City as a palimpsest in that way where you know physical physically we all you know live in homes that usually uh, you know there are pri pr uh, prior residents there so we're kind of living amongst the past beneath, beneath the walls beneath the layers of paint um, so that that's always kind of been in the spirit of the movie, and then you know, we realized that we had somewhat of a uh, you know unique, complicated story uh, to describe, in as you have to you, as you have to um, when you try to market a movie with a somewhat complicated title. So we, we we decided to go for a less original title, but one that I, I think uh, also hits the spirit of New York in a way as well. So there, there there's a nice connection I, I feel with you know they, they wrote that movie they, they wrote that song. Uh, in New York at the time, but also I, I think it's just a, you know, I, I give them all poetic license to it. In terms of my own experience with silence, I, there's uh, one anecdote that I really like uh, as far as my, my bag of anecdotes go, uh, that we we found where the experimental composer um, John Cage tells the story a lot of um, him going into what's called an anechoic chamber, a room devoid of, uh, of noise. And uh, after being in there for, for, for a period of time, he left and uh, felt that he still uh, heard things. And he talked to the sound engineer about what he heard, and the sound engineer described to him that you know, uh, he heard the sound of his blood flowing through his veins and also his uh, nervous system in operation. And I like to think that you know, even in true silence, we, we can't escape ourselves, and uh, that there is, uh, there's maybe no such thing. Thank you. Oh, the, the sound of silence. No, the, the, the original time. Palimpsest. Oh, I'm sorry, palimpsest. It's a, it's a word also from the Middle Ages. Can you spell it? Yeah, it's a P. <laughs> I feel like I'm on a spelling bee. It's also bee. in the sheet. That yeah. Yes, it's, it, it is written down, yeah. Um, and just to say, I mean, John Cage did also, uh, he had a, a famous performance called 433, That's right. uh, which was famously, he got up and, and sat at a piano for four minutes and 33 seconds in silence, uh, <laughs> so to speak. Um, unless anybody has a burning question, um, I will invite all of you uh, across the street to the Mexican restaurant, which is called To Cuba. They have a like special happy hour food and drinks for people who came at the bar. Um, so if anyone wants to continue to be with themselves and other people uh, and listen to things, uh, they're welcome to join. And I just want to thank Jana Levin and Michael Tybersky so much. And thank all of you. <laughs> And I'll also just say, please come back for other science on screen programs. If you feel the next one is uh, October 25th and 26th, we will be showing the films of Swedish environmentalist uh, and documentarian Mikael Christensen, who made observational, beautiful observational documentaries about birds and urban environments. And we'll be talking about the similarities between Swedish and New York City coastlines and waterways and migration patterns and how urban development has impacted that. So thank you again.